Please help me welcome a true American hero, someone that I'm sure that could have equally been a part of Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, retired Army, retired Army, Army Air Force Sergeant Frank Dunlap. Frank. There's two apologies I'd like to make before I start. One is that I apologize for not being able to give more details, but because of the time involved, we'll just probably touch some of the highlights. And the second apology is that there's something that's buried in my mind that I'll never leave. So during my little talk, you might see me choke up and you might see me cry. But it's something that, that I'll live with. So I just, <clears throat> I hope that I can bring some of the highlights of a lot of things I can't tell you. Uh, along the brutalities, some of those things I can't tell you. Some of them I can. But we'll start out this way. Frank, I want to thank you so much for giving me <clears throat> for giving me the pleasure and the honor. I'm gonna say something to start with and then I'll try to back, if I remember it. They took me out to Frisco Boys of Mac nineteen forty one. They put me on the President Coolidge and said, So long, you son of a gun. I sailed the Blue Pacific, I landed in Old Patan. Now, my friends and neighbors, let me tell you who I am. I'm a hungry man from Old Patan. There's nothing in the pot. Old Franklin came before the house and I had a fireside chat. He said, boys, we'll win this bloody war. We've got it in a hat. He said, we had a navy, the finest in the world. But with the obsolete guns they got, they couldn't kill a squirrel. So come on, you Americans, and send some help our way. And help us set this flying sun that's flying every day. That was a little script that I tried to write during the time that I didn't have much to do. And that was maybe two seconds out of a day. To start out with... <clears throat> Uh, as Frank had told you, they did take me, uh, I was sort of, I went in service in 41. And uh, when I got inducted in Charlotte, I had to go to Charlotte. And finally, I was, my name was called. And I went up and I sat down with the sergeant. And we chatted a few minutes. And back in 1937 and 38, I went then to what we call a CMTC camp, Citizen Training Military Camp at Fort Bragg, six weeks out of the summer to give us something to do. So when I sat down and got to talking to the sergeant, both of us hit a nail on the head. I remember you, Dunlap. I said, what? I was a quartermaster in the um, in charge of the kitchen when you were down here living in tents with the CMTC. I said, holy micro. <laughs> and he said, well, there's no need of me asking you what branch of service you want. He says, uh, I'll tell you right now, the first one is Air Force. I said, I'll take it. That was the Army Air Corps. And, of course, later on it was changed to the United States Air Force. And so there, I went to Savannah, Georgia, there for six or seven months. And then we got orders to pack up everything and leave. Had no idea where we were going. So we got to San Francisco 
And then they put us aboard the ship, as I say, President Coolidge line, and it had not been stripped. It, this was so fast. And we got our orders in Guam. Then the captain said, we're headed to Manila. Where's that? We had no idea where, where we were going or what Manila was or where it was. Philippine Islands. So we got to the Philippines on Thanksgiving Day. Docked the boat. The, the crew, the uh, kitchen crew, had Thanksgiving dinner for us. We didn't get it. We gave it to all the dock workers and all. Finally, we got unloaded and got to our quarters, which was tents, another tent city. And uh, the old Colonel Lair, in charge of the Filipino army, said, fellas, we're sorry, but the barracks are not ready. So we're going to have new barracks for you. But we had tents. Well, that was okay. How long are we going to be in the tents? So this went on for a little while. We got up... Uh, this big monstrous tent put up for headquarters and we had quite a few radios and communication systems and we were okay there for a few days in fact 17 days then all at once everybody started hollering and hooping and crying and oh it can't be it won't be we finally asked well what's going on the Japanese just bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, on the way, our trip on the way to Manila, we did see and encounter several fishing boats, which were the Japanese fishing boats, but they were the observation boats. We were the last crew that got into Manila. We did have a stop in Hawaii for two days, waiting for another troop ship to come from Norfolk, Virginia. We got a couple of days to visit Hawaii. I've been to Hawaii. Anybody want to go to Hawaii? No, it's not any different from the coast we got here. But uh, anyway, 17 days later, and it's due to the international data line, we were on the 8th instead of the 7th. But the same morning, Two hours later, the Japanese were bombing Manila, Philippines. So that was about to bring us up to part of where we really got started. So a little later on, after about a month, MacArthur ordered uh, the defense stand the, where we were going to maintain our final defense was Bataan the peninsula of Bataan, which we had the uh, intercoastal waterway between Bataan and Corregidor. So we were there for several months. The Japanese intended to take the island, uh, Bataan, take Luzon in four to six weeks. Took them four months. They lost thousands and thousands of men. We had one division, the 31st Infantry Division, was on the front line. They were on the front line the day we surrendered on April the 9th, 8th, 9th day 8th normally. And uh, so, MacArthur, in the meantime, had orders from Washington to go to Australia to rebuild forces there to come back to the Philippines. Which, of course, his famous words was, I shall return. Well, we surrendered on the little left field down there in Bataan. I would estimate and guess and have been told, approximately with the Filipino scouts and the Amer Allies troops that we had was about 70,000 that we surrendered on a little airstrip. 
it was pretty packed, but we were all there. Well, it all started right there. Any person that had anything of any value was stripped of it right then. If he had a ring on, he couldn't get it off, he cut his finger off. Get the ring. So, about, I guess I'd say two days, we were lined up in a, another little field between, between all of the Japanese artillery brought in facing to pound Kregador. So then they called us all out again and we started. Where were we going? No, where were we going? Just line up. Well, we found out later what, why it was called the Bataan Death March. We lost close to 13,000 men on that march from diseases of any type of disease that you could come up with Somewhere in that troops had it. And if you fell if they fell out from heat exhaustion or other diseases, thirst, no water, no food, no nothing. If you fell out, you either got up yourself and tried to stumble on or you were either beheaded a bayoneted or shot with a very small gun, which was called a 25 automatic. And they'd shoot them through the temple. And they would lay there, and as you walked by them or stepped over them, every time they took a breath, you'd see the blood shoot out. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> then the next place, we stopped to get that brutality was at the artesian well. If you left your rank, you knew you wasn't going to come back. Because when you went out there to drink, you either got stabbed or beheaded and left laying there. You couldn't help anybody. If you go to help your buddy, then they'd stab you. So this went on quite a while until we got to Camp O'Donnell which was in, anywhere from 65 to 75 miles walking in extreme heat. Well, you can imagine by that time, we found out what a G-string was called. You've seen the movies that the Japanese uh, wrestlers and all wearing G-strings. We'd shedded all our clothes, shoes, Everything that we could take off, we took off because of the temperature of being 110, 112 degrees. So we finally made the Camp O'Donnell, which was a, never have figured out to the day and nobody's ever told me, but we thought maybe it was a dumpster of some kind. But uh, we crowded the 50-something thousand soldiers in this little Bob Wife fenced in camp. And there we were losing actually 200 Filipinos and 100, 200 Americans every day. No medical treatment, no food, no water, no nothing. After that, we worked on local details so they would take eight or ten of us out on a little detail to be done. And we were there for quite a few months. And then finally, they sent us, and I think you've probably heard of it, or you've maybe seen it on the movie, the American Special Forces went into Cabana to Juan. That was the original main camp for the prisoners. And uh, I, I had left there. While I was there, I did work on an airfield. We built a mile and a half main runway, and I think it was two small taxi pads to get in and off the main runway with nothing but picks, shovels, and wheelbarrows. 
During the monsoon season, we worked with mud up to our knees, day in and day out, from sun up to sundown. Rice for breakfast, noon and night, and no place to lay. Well, we did have a little old bamboo hut, and if you could find any any kind of a bedding, straw, grass, or something to use for a little bedding, well, that's what we had. And we were there for several months building that airfield. And that was strictly, strictly hard labor. And there again, we've had boys that were out there trying to dig down in banks higher than this wall, undercoating it, and then getting up and going across the top and cutting, cutting it out so I let it fall in one big block. We had the boys to break the backs, the legs, the arms, hopefully that they wouldn't have to go back the next day. Well, we didn't have any hospital, we didn't have any doctors, we didn't have any nurses. We had, uh, of course, we had some orderlies, first aid orderlies, but uh, those men didn't get to stay in more than a couple of days. They were right back to work, just like they jerked me off of a truck and I broke my right wrist. They stuck a little board on there and wrapped a little gauze around it. The next day I was out carrying rail, railroad rails with my left hand with a bunch of guys. And that's pretty much the story all the way through my three and a half years of prison war. It wasn't easy. And I might break just a second and say, if anybody in here, and I'm I'm just an ordinary church goer, but if there's not anybody in here don't believe in what's above us to take care of us, then I make a suggestion that you go try because I've been to hell and I don't want to go back. We left there and went on a boat called the Hell Ships. Well, they loaded about 800 of us on the bottom of this supply ship, which our Navy at that time had a few submarines prowling the Pacific. But the Jap ships had no markings with any POW and any, any information that they had POWs. So our submarine sank a couple of them about, they went about a thousand men right there in the middle of the Pacific. We had another lucky time that they missed our boat about a yard to two yards on the torpedoes. So we made it to Formosa. We went to Hong Kong first. We laid in bay out there for 13 days waiting to try to get a clearance. All the Japs waiting to get a clearance. And we got to Formosa after 13 days and we lost an average of two to three men a day. In the bottom of that boat, you stood up. You didn't sit down. You couldn't lay down. And if you didn't make it that day, we still kept you down there for a few days before the Japs would <laughs> eventually take them aboard and drop them overboard. We made Formosa. And when we got to Formosa, of course, we worked again doing garden work, raising vegetables for ourselves and also the Japanese soldiers. They were out of food. And um, so we did that for about a month before we got on a ship and moved again to Japan. We got up to Kosaka the northern tip of Japan, <coughs> we could reach out and shake hands with our Russian mates up there. 
there we worked in the mines, doing anything that needed to be done to make, repair uh, the Japanese Army equipment. I worked in the sheet metal department for a while, then I worked in the mine for a little bit, and I <laughs> had to laugh and tell this guy the other day that was down at my house doing some work, putting in some box hedges in the front and the back of the house. He said, now, I said, Frank, what you need now is get some gravel and put it at the base of your shrubs. I went to Lowe's, and they had what you call a slag. Well, the slag was $2.29 for a little 20-pound <coughs> bag of rock, which was painted and turned painted red and so forth. But I laughed. I said, you know what? I did that in empty tons of that slag right out there in that valley. <laughs> well, why don't you take the truck and go away and get a load? <laughs> I said, no, I can't quite do that now. Uh, but we worked in the uh, mines there. I had a, first I had a job in the uh, sheet metal department, and we did a little bit of uh, making boilers and things like that, and we did do a little sabotage work. We were supposed to drill a hole exactly at this dimension. We missed it a half inch or an inch. Well, that delayed that uh, equipment for a while until they could bring some uh, tanks to, for oxygen or whatever to run their soldering guns. It delayed it for a month or two months. So we did a little bit. But then as time went on and uh, We lost a few men there, too. Right now, I was told, oh, a few weeks ago, that the prisoners in the Philippines, there were probably maybe between 150 to 100 still living. I'm 87 years old. I'll be 88 in September. Um, I know that I'm just touching the highlights. Like I say, I go back to the really tormenting of the Japanese troops, which were the ones that we fought against. They were really brutal. Now, after we got to Formosa in Japan, it eased up a little bit because what we had then were civilians, but they weren't civilians. They were still under government, the emperor's restrictions. But the food got a little bit better. We did get some soybeans once in a while, and then we lost several men by eating soybeans too many. And this, after they got them inside their tummy, they began to swell up. And the first thing you know, they exploded. Same thing happened when, we, when the war was over, when the Japanese surrendered. We had the guards and all to stack their rifles, and we opened the gates and told them to go. So where are we going? We said, just go. We don't want you around here. And that was after the old Jap colonel or captain or whatever who had come out and read the orders that Japan had surrendered to them. Allied forces. Well, we hit the ground and cried and prayed and laughed and danced, just like we did when, before we left the Philippines. Uh, the Navy knew where we were. They'd come over and wave their wings, letting, letting us know that they knew where we were, and hopefully where they, they wasn't going to drop bombs on us or anything. And we hit the ground and cried and hooped and hollered. Well, we were out. Well, that was two years earlier than we th thought we were. Now, 
I've just about covered the things that I think that I could uh, say. I mean, by that, the horrible, the barbaric things, I, I just don't feel like that I want to cover, and I don't think you'd like to hear any of that. That's really brutality. I didn't tell you that I was hung by my thumbs for two days and my toes touched the ground. And then finally when they released me, I got on my knees and my hands and crawled back to the hut. There were many before me that didn't make it back to the hut. They cut them down and when they cut them down, that's where they sort of stayed. They couldn't crawl, they couldn't get up, so they beheaded them right there and let lay there for days for us to look at all the time. Just like the one other time in the, at Cabana Tawan, I'm going back a little bit, that uh, we had one or two men to try to escape Cabana Tawan. Well, it was a Nothing but a barbed wire fence up, but it was looked like chicken wire so close. And so then they divided us up in a, a group of ten. Each group contained ten. Any man in that group of ten tried to escape, the other nine would be executed. And at one time they had the movie on, and it went through showing all of that. But anyway, if we knew of a person in our group that was trying to escape, we took care of it ourselves. We had to execute them rather than let the Japs execute them. But anyway, the one that did get escape, they finally got caught a little later, two or three days or a day later. They brought them back into the camp and they took the nine men and I was on the detail for this one time, thank goodness. That was one time too many. We went out with picks and shovels and dug a hole, which was a grave. They called the nine men out and lined them up by the ditch and executed them and they fell right over into the hole. Then we just threw dirt over them. And that was something hard really to do. And then one other time like that, that I sort of skipped, I was going to tell you this, and I didn't, and at Camp O'Donnell, where 400 men were dying a day, we dug trenches in another hole, and we'd throw the bodies of those 400 men in this ditch and then cover them up with dirt, nothing else. And if we saw one, you know, that has been told, you probably know and have heard, and the doctor will tell you of who, when a person dies, the muscles still contract a little bit. So if we saw one of these guys they threw in the hole begin to move, we thought he was alive, so we pulled, got in there and pulled him out. Gave him another chance, which was probably the next day or late that afternoon. And those are some of the worst times, really, that I didn't want to face. It's hard to throw a person in a ditch and just throw sand on him, you know? and hoping, and especially when you see one move and you think he's alive and you're about to bury him. First of all, the uh, Navy sent a, a little destroyer up to pick us up at the camp up there in, in uh, North Kosaka and got us into Tokyo 
And when we got to Tokyo, then they put us uh, aboard a supply plane ship, cargo, and we're going to fly us to uh, the Philippines. And of course, during all this time, we were going through all kinds of inspections and just about everything you can think, shots and everything else, you know. And changing clothing, giving us, uh, didn't ask you what size you wore, didn't make any difference. They just, <laughs> they gave you a bag, you put it on, you know. But we got to, uh, we left Tokyo and we got to uh, Okinawa and we ran into the typhoon. So we had to stop at Okinawa, and um, we were there for a couple of days, and we sort of pegged ourselves down on the ground, on your tummy, on your belly, and used cords to tie your wrist around the little pegs that were stuck in the ground so the wind wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't blow us away. It did take ships out of that canal there and set it up on dry land. And that's a typhoon. I said, what's the difference between a typhoon and a hurricane? <laughs> they said, no comparison. Anyway, then we left there after we left uh, Okinawa to the Philippines to the hospital. And there we went through ordeal again, being treated, steamed, bath, and all of that. They didn't want any detergents or any contamination from us. So we were there for, oh, probably a week. And then we knew, we were hoping they were going to fly us back to the States. That didn't work. They brought us back on a little troop carriers, which had about eight little old bunks, one on, to on top of the other one, and if you were on the bottom bunk, you didn't dare get out because you couldn't. The man next above you was laying on your stomach. <laughs> so we got to San Francisco and at Letterman General Hospital, and we were there for a couple of weeks, and I sort of gained some of my weight back. I lost down to 89 pounds from 150, but that wasn't bad for me. The ones that were really bad was the 200 pound guys that you could read all the way through his skin and his bones. He was down 89 or 80 pounds, much more or less than I was. But anyway, when we got to uh, the hospital, they just told us that we, the Dining room was open 24 hours a day. That was bad because I gained 109 pounds in 42 days. <laughs> <laughs> we left there on a troop train and brought us to Asheville, North Carolina. On the way, we made one stop out of Chicago and reloaded the uh, train with whatever we needed, juices, orange juices, apple juice, bananas, whatever. And we got to Asheville, and they had opened a uh, hospital for returning vets. It was at Moore General Hospital, right out of Asheville. And so there, when I, I got there right before in December, and I did get to go home in Waysboro for Christmas. And we were there for about two or three months, I guess, getting recuperated and re strength, getting our strength back, and whatever dental work we needed or anything like that. Well, we kept the doctors pretty busy and we kept the nurses running all the time. <laughs> After getting back home, which was, I don't know, everybody talks about dreams and all. Well, that was my dream for three and a half years. Sit down and we had all kind of menus that we wrote down 
I sit around there at night, getting off of work. We got one canteen cup, which I'd say would be three coffee cups full of water, to wash the mud off of us a day. That was a bath water that we had. But we got back to uh, Swananoa. I was trying to figure out, okay, well, they had called my mother several times, the uh, adjutant general. One was to let, let them know that I was missing in action. That was the first reply she got. And that was in... It had been done, that was notified May the 22nd of 1942, he was missing in action. Well, I had said something to her that I thought maybe we were going to Australia. So for this length of time, she thought perhaps that after she got this, that I was on the way to Australia, or I had gotten to Australia. Then, um, I'm just trying to see a couple of things here. Uh, the hospital in the Philippines arrived in San Francisco in late 1945, transferred to Moore General Hospital in Asheville. Uh, and then it just tells about getting back home and what I did and where I went to work and so forth. Like when I was discharged, I, as I was going to to get my little bit of travel pay out, I heard somebody holler, Dunlop. Well, it was this real good friend of mine who was a captain in charge of the payout dis distribution center from Albemarle. And he said, Frank, uh, you think about what you're going to do, for, where you're going to work? I said, nope. I said, I'm going to spend this little bit of money, and then I'll think about work. But when you, when you get ready to go to work, stop by and see me. So a couple of months later, after I'd been to New York to visit my sister and her husband and piddle around a little bit and spend some of that green stuff, didn't last long, mm -hmm. I went back down to Fort Bragg and I saw my friend. I said, yeah, I'm ready to go to work. So he got me a job in the separation center, discharging soldiers uh, from all of the states. And most of them had not left the states. And I was typing up the metal plates so he cut down on paperwork. And then finally we got a little bit more into discarding the paperwork because every, every soldier went through, had all this paperwork to fill out and all of this, where he'd been and how long he'd been. So by typing up the metal plate, it pushed them right on through. So I got the job in the separation center and uh, I was driving back and forth, not every day, but semi-weekly from Wadesburg, my home, down to Fort Bragg to go to work. And that's, I ran into a little girl down there in the same office that I was in that uh, I sort of got hooked up on a little bit. And we got, we later that year got married she was a Texan girl, and I like they said, everything from Texas is big, so <laughs> I said, well, she was. So my son is six foot two, my oldest son is six three, my daughter is five eight. So I figured, well, they still carry those jeans from Texas. <laughs> From Moore General Hospital, I figured out how in the world am I going to get to Waysboro. I don't have any transportation. So I said, well, you know, 
this time they arrived. So I did. I got a ride to Charlotte. When I got to Charlotte, I called my mother. And uh, in the meantime, of course, she had, had a friend that had brought her up to Asheville to see me when I first got there. But anyway, I was on the way for the holidays, Christmas, and I got to Charlotte. And uh, I called her. Well, when I called her, the preacher was there. And he said, well, where are you, Frank? I said, I'm, right now I'm standing at the bus station. He said, well, you stay there, and I'll be there in a little bit to pick you up. So he did. He came up to Charlotte and picked me up and take me back to Wagesboro at home. And uh, in the meantime, he, on his way, he had stopped by the ball field, which we had the, a game going on, and he got out and he was a, told the guy that was broadcasting the game and all, said, just move away, I got some more. I want to say. So he uh, announced over the loudspeaker that I was on the way home after the three, three and a half years being a prisoner. And um, so he got there, he got there on time, picked me up, and I got home, and stayed there for a little while, and then went to work. While I was at work, I said, well, you know, that's when the government was offering scholarships, I suppose you want to put it that way, but it was money given to us to go to college. So I resigned that job and went to Brevard College, Brevard, North Carolina, for two years. I finished there, and they transferred my records and all to University of Tennessee, and I got accepted there. So I went to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville for one year one and a half years, I had to give that, give my last semester up that I was out at the ball diamond one afternoon practicing baseball and they called my name on the speaker to the report to the dean's office. And now who in the world called me? Why do I want to, you know, what have I done? Have I done anything? That's the first thing. I've, what have I done? Go to the dean's office. Got to the dean's office walked in, and this gentleman there, about six foot tall, I had to look up at him. He said, Dunlap? I said, yes, sir. He says, my name is so-and-so. I'm from the Veterans Administration. Yes, sir. I have some bad news. I said, well, give me the bad news, and if you got any good news, bring that back to me. He said, no. Nope. Your uh, authorization to be in school has expired. I had one, one and a half semesters to go. Well, it meant I didn't have the money, so I couldn't stay. I said, well, you know, you're just like everything else. What you should have done was to pay your tuition at Bavard College your tuition at the University of Tennessee, and I had planned and hoped for several years to become a dentist. And I said, well, if you'd have done that, then we could have sent you to Memphis Dental School for the two years or four years required. Didn't work that way. So I said, you know what? Why didn't you tell me this to start with? Why'd you wait to the end? We didn't get the paperwork. I said, well, they put it in the wrong basket. Well, they didn't go by the Geneva Convention. They did what they wanted to do for the emperor. It made no difference to anybody else or to any other country. And the first, your first question about MacArthur. MacArthur 
in my personal opinion, you can hear a lot of stories about. Why did he leave us? Abandon? He didn't abandon us. He was ordered by President Truman at that time. He knew that the Philippines were gone, and the only way back was for him to go to Australia to rebuild our army, navy, back to come back to retake Luzon in the Philippines. And that's why he was gone, and he, the uh, general that he left in charge was General Wainwright. And Wainwright said that it was the hardest job he ever did in his life. And the worst job he ever did in his life was him when he came out and told us that he had given authorization to the Japanese that we surrendered. He said that was one of the worst periods of his whole life. Um, MacArthur, I think, of course, he did his publicity stunts for Washington, primarily. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that Washington wanted to know every move he made and why, how, what time, when. So, but when he was ordered to go to Australia, I guess that was the only thing that was left for him to do, he couldn't. He couldn't very well tell the president no, and uh, so he did. He went to Australia, and while he was in Australia, he reorganized the navy, the air force, the army, and came back to the Philippines. Now that's when they showed you that he got off of the the boat and waded into the through the water. <laughs> I shall, I have returned. No, blank. Is that what you want to say? It's blank. They did not follow any of the Geneva Convention in reference to military service, war, or anything else. Nope. The only thing we did get one time, the first box was shipped to us was from England. I won't ever forget it because it had Yorkshire pudding in there. <laughs> and uh, then we did have some from the States. We were told that we were supposed to get one box of, uh, a month. Well, out of the three and a half years, we got one box from, the, from home, American, and one box from England. Um, then they were open to see if what was in there, cigarettes, of course, they took all this, anything like that, they, they just took out. But no, as far as uh, halfway being any uh, good humanity service and all, no, none whatsoever. Uh, if you stepped out of line, you got a butt of a rifle across your back or your neck. And that's about the best humanity we got. I did get beat one time, didn't tell you about that. That wasn't so important, but when they, I fell off the truck. The guy jerked the truck. I wasn't expected. He wasn't even supposed to be running. And I fell on the rock that we had hauled up there to put the base down for that airstrip and uh, the little old guards come flying over there and I was up then but knocked me down with the butt of a rifle right across my shoulder and then as soon as I hit the ground he started with his hobnail shoes coming to my face and all and I'd roll over and bypass it and <laughs> Then they pull me back and start again. I'd roll over the other way and bypass it. I got beat pretty good, but other than that, I, uh, during all that time, I just wanted to get up, you know, and re re backlash the same thing he was doing to me. But that, of course, was not possible. They're standing there, two other little guards standing there with fixed bayonets that in case I did raise my foot or something, that 
that that would be the end of me too. But no, as far as the uh, the treatment, the food, we we I would say the food, of course, was rice. Um, I wonder if you want to ask me, do I still eat rice? Yes, I, <laughs> I still eat rice, but I won't eat it dry. By the way, we did not have any media. During World War II in the Philippines, nothing on the march, all of this uh, basic little scratches we get once in a while was from some individual that had took some movies and they got a little cut of it and inserted it in different places, different remarks and all. But we had no media like today. We had, we got five soldiers killed today in Vietnam or uh, other. Next day we had six soldiers killed. You don't stop to think about how about the little, how about the little uh, mountain that we were trying to take down in Vietnam? It cost thirty thousand one day. Or how about Normandy? It cost fifty something thousand. that never did get to the to the strand out of the water. That's why they called it the Red Ocean one day. Well, <clears throat> like I said to start with, it's right up there. It's on a little wheel up there and there. When I wanted to run through, I punched a little button. And all that memory is right up there, and it never will leave. I answered this question many times. One of the first things, I bought a Nissan truck when I first got out of service. Frank, what, pardon my language, what the hell did you buy a Japanese truck for? I put the answer this way. Wrong, yes, I know. But the Japanese soldiers were indebted to their emperor. The emperor controlled that. But the captains and majors or whoever who out in the field paid no attention to that. The soldiers did what they wanted to do. I answer the question like this. Our soldiers did what our military commanders told them to do. Now, right reverse, I don't think they told the Japanese field soldiers to do the executions that they were doing but they always looked the other way. But normally I would say the better part of the Japanese army was doing what the emperor wanted them to do. Therefore, they were carrying out their orders from their supreme commander, like our soldiers were doing from our supreme commander. So you really couldn't the, uh, the treatments that we got from the Japanese mainly to start with was the ones that we had been fighting against for four months. The ones that, that our infantry had killed about 150,000 Japanese troops, which made no difference to them. But they were just barbaric. But then when you get down to the ground level, the ones that were halfway decent all, taking their orders from the emperor or the field marshals, did what they were asked to do, and that's what our men did. And I still carry a lot of that in my mind. Don't ever forget it. I won't. I've had it for, well, let's say 86 years, 85 years. So another year or two, hopefully, it still won't go away. The uh, vet veterans of World War II, the commander over in Florence, South Carolina, I made a mistake one day, I opened my mouth to a young lady down there at the beach. 
uh, and uh, another friend from Charlotte, he used to ask me, well, why don't you wear a uniform when you go to make these talks? I said, well, you know, I left it hanging up in the attic, and I went up there to get it, and it wasn't anything but the moss hanging around. <laughs> so they picked this up now and asked me, would you like to be buried in your military uniform? I said, I would. So this man in Florence, South Carolina, has already had something like 60 calls from 14 or 15 states to want to get in on this. And it's not, I said, I didn't, I wasn't intended for all this to be going on. Now it's going from county local to state local. Now they're getting into national local because uh, they got to go through Congress to uh, get Congress to authorize an infantry badge for me. I said, well, I wasn't in the infantry. I was in the Air Force. <laughs> no, but you were, you were on the uh, backside of Patan to keep the Japanese from filtrating in from uh, the inlet there, this side of Cregador. I said, well, it was about a month, month and a half, maybe about a month. Well, you were still declared you were doing infantry work, yeah. So they're getting that done. They've got my, they've got my uniforms now, which they were trying to go back to the original, not the current day, but the original, boots included. I hope this, I hope this is going to be a long time before you put those on, though, Frank. <laughs> Frank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.